Hi, everybody. Welcome to Shasad Podcast, conversations between scholars from around the world who study childhood, youth, and related institutions historically. As an official production of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, you can subscribe to these shows through iTunes or Google Play. Written and visual materials associated with each episode are available at our website, shcy.org. Enjoy. Um, hi, everyone, and welcome to the Society for the History of Children and Youth Origins Project discussion. Thanks for tuning in. Um, my name is Tamara Myers. I'm the current president of the Society for the History of Children and Youth, and I'm also a professor of history at the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, Canada. So today I've assembled um, a group of scholars um, who have had uh, various and multiple um, impacts on the history of childhood and youth. And as part of um, the Origins Project, we want to um, today reflect on the, the ways in which um, all of you participated um, in the establishing of not only the society, the journal, but the history of ch um, childhood and youth. Um, and, and also um, to think through where we've been and maybe where we're going. Um, so there's lots to talk about. And I want to start today by asking Chris Lynn. Oh, no, I want to start today by introducing who I've got here. And so if I may, um, and I'll ask, I'll add to this, um, this recording, um, a text file where you can see the, the elaborate bios of um, our participants today. So Laura Lovett is an associate professor at the University of Pittsburgh, where she is helping to develop a childhood studies program. And she was the founding co-editor of the Journal of the History of Childhood and Youth from 2005 to 15. Krista Lindenmeyer is professor, university professor and dean emeritus at Rutgers um, University Camden. She was a founding member of the society and past president uh, from 2005 to 2007. Stephen Mintz is a professor of history at the University of Texas at Austin, and he was president of the society from 2009 to 2011. Abank Sandin is Professor Emeritus. He was one of the founding um, professors at the Department of Child Studies and Link Shipping um, when it began in 1989. And he was president uh, of the Society of History of Children and Youth from 2011 to 13. Banks, I think you forgot those, <laughs> those dates, but we have not forgotten. <laughs> <laughs> right. So uh, let's kick things off. Um, Chris, can I turn to you and ask you about this Origins Project and what you and some of your colleagues um, are trying to do in establishing a narrative around the origins? Sure. So a uh, few people that I had worked with early on, particularly Joe Haas, uh, was very interested in trying to pull together some archival material, uh, interviews, to try to talk about the founding of the idea of the history of childhood as a serious research topic and topic that should be covered by universities. So the Origins Project is an attempt to try to pull together some of the people who were at the origins, at the beginnings of this. Um, some of them are in the United States, some of them are outside of the United States, and this panel is just a way to launch that project and get us started in discussing how this field has developed over time and how it became um, part of the Society for the History of Children and Youth. Great, thanks. Um, I might ask the, um, the other participants, how did you get involved in the history of childhood and youth? And I mean that in a way, um, partly historiographically, um, where did you come from intellectually and how did you end up um, being foundational to a society that we now um, uh, all participate in? Who would like to start? <laughs> Banks, do you want to jump in? Yeah, I can jump in. I mean, 
I actually I came into this history of childhood really as a graduate student because I had a very prolific professor Bigito Dean, the first female professor in humanities in in uh, Lund. Uh, uh, in, well, no, I think almost in, in well, whatever. Uh, and uh, she was very prolific and she kind of developed in huge different areas. I mean, emigration and family history and history of aging and all these different fields. And one of the things that she took initiative to doing was, was applying for an external grant for doing a history of childhood, basically. And that was early 70s. And, and, uh, and I had just come back from America where I studied at UCLA and I studied black history and I found that there was nobody around in Sweden that knew anything about black history and now and and basically I was looking for something where I had could talk to people about the topic that I was writing and then I somebody asked me to basically join this project so that I came into that through that and and uh, and I worked with that for a long time then. Uh, I mean, it took a long time for me to finish my PhD. Uh, I built a house and I had three kids and uh, was trained as a nurse and all this kind of stuff that went on, on at the same time. But, uh, but that was basically a, a situation where you could say that history of childhood kind of evolved uh, with tentacles out into family history, history of education. And as a young aggressive, uh, graduate student, I was very interested in making sure that what I was doing was something unique. It was not the history of education, it was not the history of the family, but was the history of childhood, history of children and children's agency. And we were very much influenced by, you know, history from below, Hobsbawm, E.P. Thompson, and all this kind of thing. And it was very basically also part of the discussion back here in Sweden about children's rights and, and uh, new legislations about the right to abolish, uh, abolish child abuse and all this kind of stuff and the beating of children in families and all this kind of stuff. So it was highly politicized at the same time on the fringes of the basically highly politicized everything at the time. Uh, and interestingly enough, that became in itself a very central aspect of the discussion about children in Sweden at the time, the political discussion about children at the time, in government reports and stuff like that, people wrote little pieces about the history of children in the government report, which was kind of, it was very Ariesque naturally, because that was kind of the dominating notion there. But it was also something that evolved into when you talked about studying children, people started thinking, well, we need history. We cannot do that without history. So it became something very, and out of there came a, an interest for establishing, establishing a research field. I mean, basically child studies uh, very early in Sweden. Uh, and, and that discussion itself took for granted that you would look at the history of children from the point of view, of, uh, first of all, you, that you should have a history of children in a, a department about child studies. That should be one of the nucleus, that and psychology. And then later on came in other things. But basically, history was one of the founding aspects of that. And uh, I became lucky enough to be able to hire to do that, which was kind of very, very important for the field because it also gave them, I mean, not that I did it, but that it was given the position there as one of the kind of interests because it broke up the kind of the positivistic dominance within psychology, looking at from it a relative point of view, and it's kind of made it more prolific. So at that situation, I think the problem was for me in a way, whether I should, whether I should be accepted as an historian at the same time I was a historian of childhood, or whether I should be accepted as something, a child studies person, or whether I should be accepted as a historian of childhood. So that is, and that is one of the conflicts within this field, as a thing. But given that, I mean, I was very happy when I saw, I mean, I met Chris at some conferences in the States, and I also heard about this organization. And what I liked about that was that it was an organization about the history of children and childhood and youth without the contamination of family history, history of education, etc. that it kind of took on a role on itself, which I kind of appreciated. 
because otherwise you're always dominated by these other fields. And then I, I, you, well, I can come back. I have much more to say, but I think it's wonderful that we're having this conversation. Thank you. Yeah, you remind me very much of my experience um, in grad school in the 1990s, where I was, I thought I was a woman's and gender historian, which I was, and then I was very taken with criminal justice history and juvenile justice yeah. history. And it didn't occur to me until I think um, I saw the advert for the 2003 Society for the History of Children and Youth conference in Baltimore in yeah. um, at the University of Maryland. Um, and that was really formative for me. It really changed um, the way that I looked at what I was doing. And because I was quite, um, I was very much interested in sexual regulation and the state and juvenile justice. And I didn't, as much as I wanted to champion the girls, I didn't conceive of this as a history of childhood per se. Did the rest of you um, have a similar trajectory or? Well, um, some fields blossom and some fields die. And I was in a field originally that died. Uh, family history had a big impact and the same-sex marriage case, I think, is really an outgrowth in many ways of the scholarship that occurred on the history of the family, of seeing the family not as some primeval, uh, unchanging, static entity, but rather as a constantly evolving institution. But the field itself did not go anywhere. Uh, it's true there's journals, but it's not vibrant in the way history of childhood is. Uh, it seems that once we discovered some of the contours of the field, that was it. And there was no other place to go. Now, there was a danger, I think, that the history of childhood was going to face the same problem, because for the general public, the history of childhood is RES, right? It's that uh, children were discovered at some point, whether it was in the 16th century or the 17th century, the 18th century, and that's really all you need to know because everything else is just a footnote. But what was exciting, uh, beginning, I think, at that crucial moment in the uh, 1980s, 1990s, was the discovery that the history of childhood is the missing link. It is the connection between the public and the private. It's the connection between the personal and the political. It is the absolute key to understanding how people are socialized into gender roles or into racial or ethnic identities. It is the key to state building that, at least in the United States, the whole development of law hinges on the history of children. Institution building is tied up with childhood. Uh, suddenly it became clear that this was the entryway into a lot of bigger issues. And it was the one area, I think, where historians could really talk to social scientists, to legal scholars and policy makers. And so I think when uh, Christy, organized that meeting at the Benton Foundation, which was really the foundational moment for our field, people were ready for something to happen. Chris, do you want to um, explain to our audience what that, what that was? Um, I wasn't there. <laughs> well, the Benton Foundation is still an existing foundation. Uh, located in Washington, D.C. Uh, they, they've been lobbying on behalf of children's interests for a long time. And our Joe Haas and Ray Heiner to put together a group of historians who could talk about the history of childhood uh, to inform the Benton Foundation's policies and possibly even have some project outcome um, from that. One of the things that we did after meeting several times with the Benton Foundation was decide that we needed to have a conference of historians who were invited to come and talk about their work and about the history of childhood. It was the first time that I know of that, at least in the United States, we pulled together a group of scholars like this. 
And no one at that point, I think, really identified themselves as historians of childhood. So it's exactly as Steve suggested. Um, we went through publications and looked at people who we thought were interested in various aspects of children's experiences and lives and the policies that affected children, but they didn't necessarily see themselves as a historian of childhood. They were a historian of women and gender. They were a historian of family, of education, of legal justice, um, psychology. I mean, you name it, people from many different areas. So that meeting, which happened in August of 2000, we invited 60 scholars, um, mostly historians, but some from other fields as well. Who, and that is where we really pulled the idea together for starting a society mm -hmm. so that we could um, have better communication. And it developed in many ways from that point on. So we can continue that discussion into talking about how we became international. But I also think um, it's just important to note that every one of us came to this from another field um, because that's just how in the early days the origins of this began. Yeah. Laura came, I know, from another field too. Laura, go ahead. Yeah, I, so I was a gender and women's history professor or as a graduate student actually and I had a, I had a child in grad school and it turned out it was, I was fairly, I was one of the first people at Berkeley to do so. And um, I remember my professor introducing me to somebody and it became clear that the way in which she thought about the women's movement did not think about children as a component of that in the way that I really thought about it. I think that was a generational shift in the way in which the women's movement was defined. Um, and so I, I was really interested in how did the state begin to invest in children and found myself kind of unt untangling that through, um, surprising to me, kind of a history of eugenics, um, which was not at all the place I imagined I would be or would go. Um, and my last year at, at Berkeley, where I was a graduate student, Paula Fass offered a graduate class on the history of childhood and youth. And I took the class, I, I didn't need any, you know, I was actually commuting from somewhere else at the time and it was quite a challenge to do so, but I just knew that this was something that needed to be, that, was, that, would, that grabbed me, that was clearly a way to frame the kind of issues that I was struggling to pull together. Um, and so that's, that's where I came from. And I think Chris was also, I remember Chris's name from the HNET Women, women's list that she had run. So she, like me, came from gender history. Exactly. Well, I think it's, it's fascinating to think about how, how these, how history of childhood kind of is, is uh, exists within the framework of other, other kind of disciplines, other kind of areas, and how it's kind of, on one hand, it's kind of satisfying to see it there, but at the same time, it kind of moves out of it, it propels out of it, and th then there's almost a need for an organization. I think it, I think Stephen kind of mentioned in a sense how this organization came about as an answer to something, something that was going on. But I do think that there is a lot of, I mean, I think that this issue remains. I mean, if you look at, for example, the social science history uh, organization and the European social science organization, there's still history of childhood is kind of ingrained in history of family, history of women, history of law, history of, of crime. I mean, all these different networks, and including the, the feminist orientations. But it has different meanings in those contexts than in the organization that society of the history of children and youth represents. It kind of meant something. It's kind of a, ch a game changer in a sense. So by the time I got to the first conference in 2003, it looked like I'd, I'd found something that was very well organized and that had, had um, legs already. Um, so <laughs> it, it, well, the organizing, it seems, happened very, very quickly. Um, do, do any of you want to talk, maybe Laura, you could talk a bit about how you moved very, again, very quickly from these um, biennial conferences 
to the need for a journal because the journal begins in 2008 which means you must have been working on it years and ahead of that i think it actually began in 2005 um, so I, I think I got looped into that first meeting and all of a sudden people were talking about the need for some way to recognize, to help, to help to propel the, the field. And I remember Jim Martin and um, Michael Grossman at the time. Um, Grossberg. 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 Um, Catherine, sorry. Catherine Jones, um, Chris and... And Stephen, we're sort of talking about a way to create a, 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 a recognition. And I had just moved to the University of Massachusetts Amherst, which has a five college collaborative structure. And I was a very excited um, new member of the department. I had, I had left my old position. I'd been the first woman on pre-tenure to have a baby at the University of Tennessee, Chattanooga, and they had no way to handle that. So I'd sort of remade myself um, in a new place. And I found myself having conversations out of, the, out of the conference with colleagues. And I would tell them, do you realize that if you look at the age of the person that you're, you're talking about or the group of people that you're talking about, you're actually doing children's history. And it was the kind of thing, inevitably, it, would, it was absolutely revelatory to everyone I would have a conversation with where they'd go, oh, you could see them like rethink. Huh, I'd never thought about age as a category of analysis. And um, so, we, I, I wanted to take advantage of the five college resources. And so um, we put together a collaborative proposal with Karen Sanchez Epler, who is in the English department at Amherst College, um, but was very much interested in the history of children and youth and their materials. We also worked with Martha Saxton at likewise at Amherst College and a colleague of mine at UMass named Brian Bunk to put together a proposal for the journal. Um, and uh, we, uh, with the, the advice of Michael Grossberg, sort of wound up shopping that to different uh, presses. And we were insistent, and maybe this was because I came from feminist um, history, we were going we to collaboratively edit this journal, um, which was not possible to do <laughs> according to the structures of the public publishers. Um, so we were very much a collaborative group of, of scholars who would meet every month to work on the, the manuscripts. But I think I was the name of record because they wanted one person um, just to make sure that if it, if it failed, there was a reason for it. Um, what was interesting is that Johns Hopkins always told us that the sign of a successful journal is if it makes it beyond the first editor. And so we were really concerned that if it moved on, it needed to sort of flourish in a way that would demonstrate that this was, this was a field that was growing. I think you're bringing up something interesting there also in terms of the fact that the journal was named the history of the Society for the History of Children and Youth. I mean, and the journal the same. And as I remember, there was this, at some time a discussion about childhood. I mean, whether it is, and there, I mean, I think that there is a difference sometimes within this field, whether you talk about children or whether you talk about childhood. And sometimes as an historian, I think it's kind of, I mean, I was never interested where we developed the Department of Child Studies. Uh, I, I never thought of the idea of calling the Department of Childhood Studies. That was not, not even a, 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 an issue because for an historian, the notion that actually child different childhoods exist in the past was self evidence that was not a i mean it was no brainer there was nothing to kind of throw out as a policy thing and saying we do we are actually doing childhood and that's different in different times and different cultures that was i mean because we were looking at children and trying to look at the child child agency that was the new thing and, and given that we were at odds sometimes with the with the feminists so the, and uh, with other fields and also very much with the history of, of education who kind of, at least when we, we started, I mean, there was kind of a Nordic network of young uh, scholars like me in Norway and Denmark and stuff like that, with Ning, for example, and, and others uh, around in, in the Nordics. And we started already doing, I mean, early 90s. 
in late eighties to, to kind of have networks and apply for money for child for, ch for projects on children. And that was very much in kind of a in conflict with an establishment within education who we thought was kind of kind of imperialistic controlling the whole field. And we really was very careful for us to kind of say, well, we are doing something different. And also with the education kind of establishment, I mean, all these gray old men in their suits who figured that, who looked at us as something that the cat had brought in from the ghetto. And, and, uh, and it was, I mean, I thought it was really, and I, I mean, at the same time, we had tremendous support from our department and from our department in different places. So it was very kind of a, well, it was an interesting the way the field evolved from there. And when I came to, to the Baltimore conference, on the other hand, and I mean, Christy knows that, I was kind of struck in a sense as a European coming in there. And I mean, I think that was my first conference too. Come on. Uh, and I was there, but then I was struck over the fact that it was so American, mm -hmm. that it was so, so U.S. and so Pennsylvania or so Virginia or whatever. I mean, it was so provincial in in a sense. At the same time, there was an energy and an enthusiasm, and and a, and a willing to do something together, which I missed from from Europe or from there, because there it was all kind of. Well, that was not at all the same kind of energy and, and enthusiasm. So I was really kind of roped in, as you say, to our, or those, or others said, roped in to, to participate in that. And I really enjoyed that. One so, thing that one, interests me is the question of how a field emerges. And the history of childhood really emerged three times and only caught fire the third time. The first is, of course, Arias and people who were inspired by him. And then there were the, in the United States, the colonial historians, the Demoses and Zuckermans and all. And then this third case. So why did the third one catch fire when the other two didn't? And there, I think, first there were presses that were crucial. Twain, and NYU and Rutgers embraced the field. And they not only provided a place to publish, but they created options to publish that were very exciting for graduate students. Then I think Paula Fass was absolutely essential to the development of the field. Her encyclopedia helped knit us together as a kind of community uh, and show that there was a linkage among work that otherwise might have been seen as disparate, but in fact all fit together. And then third, the conferences were hugely important and they uh, evolved pretty quickly from pretty small and intimate mm -hmm. meetings to much larger and much more public meetings, still not huge, uh, which gave them much of their appeal, but uh, but showed the diversity of people in the field and the topics that were being addressed. I, I would add one fourth item to that, and that's technology. So we started H Childhood yeah. uh, as a way to tie scholars together who were certainly disparate not only in the way that they studied the history of children and youth, but also in their locations. And because H Childhood was a part of HNET, we were able to pull together an international group of scholars from the beginning. Um, as Banks said initially, especially because we were in the United States, I was located in the United States, the early conferences uh, focused primarily on the US, but it became very clear and especially online with our H childhood um, focus that this was an international field that was exciting. Not many other people had been looking at age as a perspective for understanding the nuances of societies and their change over time. And that children could serve as Joe Haas has said, kind of the canary in the mine for opening up what the societies around the world were really like um, by looking at children's experiences. 
So that ability to be able to pull together third times the charm, <laughs> as well as uh, the technology to make the collaborations possible, I think also were very important to this. Yeah, and I, I think for me, from a personal standpoint, um, you know, going to that 2003 conference, which is sort of where I met Mona Gleason. I'd met her earlier, like briefly at family history conferences. Um, but it was there that we, st we, we turned to each other and said, this is really American. <laughs> just, just, <laughs> it may sound funny from a Canadian, um, but it's a kind of sensibility. It, um, but I, I'm not sure if we met you at that point, Banked, but there was a, um, a way in which there was this, it felt like the, um, in the U.S. you had this very solid burgeoning historiography, and it made us reflect on um, childhood studies um, in Canada. And so it, I remember thinking or um, thinking that some of the researchers who should have been there or should come to the next one were people who studied indigenous use, the stolen, the stolen generation, the marginalized and racialized um, children that were subject of state policy. Um, and so it gave us, um, I think, a way to think through what we were teaching at home um, and also the way that we might shape um, uh, future panels at conferences. And so I really felt like there's this, this enormous takeaway from those early 2003, 2005 conferences where um, we saw what um, others were doing and increasingly people from, um, from Europe to begin with um, and then other regions of the world um, eventually. And it's still a challenge that we're working on, but it's, um, it, it's felt to me like this was a pivotal moment, a moment where there's tremendous energy. Um, it wasn't just like going to areas and saying, oh yeah, there is a field there, but rather it was junior scholars and, and also people who had been around long enough who, and had the insight to you know, build conferences and build journals. It, it was so helpful to have both senior scholars and new people in the field. So especially going back to age childhood, one of our early editors was Shirley Swain in Australia. And Shirley did study indigenous children in Australia and the public, the uh, state policies that directly affected them. And then Pat Ryan came in, who was a newly minted uh, PhD. And I th think, in fact, when he first started, he was still a graduate student. And yeah. his perspective on the United States and the policies for dependent children in the United States, having those two working with a childhood, I think really helped a lot to internationalize the field and make sure that we didn't focus too narrowly on just the United States. Mm -hmm. Very helpful. Uh, one thing that strikes me is a kind of paradox, which is, the public's interest in children was immense. And many of the early books that came out in our field, uh, Wilma King's Study of Slave Childhood, or Gary Cross's book on uh, toys, attracted enormous public attention, uh, well outside what history books normally get. Uh, and there was a lot of public interest as parenting styles were changing. And there was a lot of debate about the well-being of children and children's disabilities and children at risk. And our field spoke to that. So on a public level, uh, our field got immense visibility early on. And yet within our own discipline, and here I'm speaking entirely of history, it did not get the respect that it deserved. And that, unfortunately, I think continues to today. And the American Historical Review is gonna be printing an article that Banked and Nira Milanich and I were going to respond to. That's a real attack on our field, uh, claiming that it's overly sentimental and under-theorized and disconnected from larger historical themes, all of which I think we demonstrate decisively is incorrect. But that's 
placed our field in this sort of funny position where there actually is a public much interested in what we do, but there is not as much institutional disciplinary respect as the field deserves. Yeah, well, as, well, we are both in that, that kind of debate there, and, and I fully agree with everything you say here, uh, Steve. Uh, but I do, ha I have an issue there about, about the importance that historians of childhood link their things to, I mean, I, I, I do think, for example, I mean, you're, you're right there also in terms of why did this field develop at this time? And I think you were right in, in pointing to the fact that history of family was pretty tired. I mean, history of family in these conferences, I mean, social science history, I mean, they would be sitting there and complaining about that. No one wanted to do history of family any longer. No one is crunching numbers. <laughs> and how is that? We have to educate a new generation. And, and everybody of us was sitting there saying, yeah, we're not going to do that. We're going to do something else. Uh, and also that with the history of education, because that history of education, what they were doing with children was so uninteresting and so unstimulating while, while uh, this kind of represented something new. But then on the other hand, I thought for a long time, and I do think it's important that one think about the, the need to link the history of childhood to central aspects of the changing of society. And I, sometimes I would be criticizing that historians of children as childhood studies people tends to focus too narrowly on children. I mean, one of my kind of educational pedagogical thing is defocus children when you study children. Think about children in terms of the, the greater history. What's going on? I mean, how does, how does this new childhood fit into imperialism? How does it fit into the development of the welfare state? How does it fit into all that? And only by that, because I think that's something that also has for me been helpful to point to feminist historian who I think disregarded completely the fact that children exist and point to the fact that some of the reforms that they are working with is really reforms about children. It's not about women, it's about children and it's about that. And so I think we have a challenge uh, of sometimes putting ourselves in the context of these other changes that goes on and I think those other changes goes on. I mean, other parts of the history have easier to, I mean, I mean, different nations have different kind of major narratives or that are important to the, the core of the history. And I think each nation has its own challenge in terms of trying to find what is the core? Where do I need to put my, my effort to show that the history of childhood is important? And in my case, I mean, you can't be a Swedish historian without relating to the state and the welfare state, right? So if you can't put children in relationship to that, you're lost. I don't have to do it in relationship to imperialism because it was a long time we were successful with that. So you do, and I, I think that's different, but I think that is a challenge for historians to, to on one hand have a core, but on the hand, other hand also reach out and address things that are relevant with other fields of the historical kind of scholarship. One of the things that we did, and, and you have the title to thank for, for me, I decided it would be childhood and youth because I, I worked in policy and I wanted to make sure that there was some way for people who worked on something besides children's agency to contribute to the journal. Yeah. But we added a section and we brought in a government theorist to do it on policy. And that I think ran for the 10 years that we ran the journal. And it was, I found the one place I could get historians to make claims about the importance of their work for policy. It's very hard to get historians to move off of the mm. comment about this is what my evidence says, so here's what we should do, right? Political scientists are happy to do it, anthropologists more than happy. I can tell you exactly what you should do based on my, you know, by dig on this. But historians are so careful to only claim what they have kind of direct evidence of, except that we could nurture them to do it in children on children. Mm. And so we had a kind of regular outreach in terms of thinking about policy. And I think that allowed us to to especially extend the international reach of the journal, um, because there are lots of places where 
children and and their well-being really and the history of that really sort of helps to frame policy or, or at least discussions of policy well there's no question the present moment and the <laughs> health crisis the reckoning over race the tremendous economic challenges are once again pinpointing children as crucial levers of change and just as in the civil rights movement there's a real recognition again that youth is a driving force for cultural transformation both in terms of activism but also in terms of shifting sensibilities and values i i couldn't agree more and i think one of the things that drove me to want to write the book about uh, children growing up in the new deal era was to show that public policy doesn't necessarily focus on children. They don't intend policies to help children, but that public policy makes a huge difference in the lives of children. Yeah. And in the 1930s, the focus on trying to level the playing field uh, in the United States through the New Deal had a dramatic effect on defining what was middle class childhood and what was going to be mo considered modern ideal childhood for the 20th and 21st century. Mm -hmm. uh, that is becoming, I think, extremely obvious again, of course, in the midst of this pandemic. Uh, just as Steve said, the, the consequences for children have been heavier than almost any uh, group unless you look at the elderly who have suffered so terribly with the disease. But the impact of the changes in society, schooling, uh, health care, children's care, uh, the impact of children not being able to socialize mm -hmm. and be with each other, the defining of who is a child and who isn't a child, and who qualifies for the state being concerned about their future. That mm. all has come to the surface in this pandemic. I think it's very important for historians to help define the policies. And it makes me uh, frankly angry that historians don't go ahead and speculate about current issues often when they write about the past. Um, why not take the knowledge that you have and then try to inform current policy issues and decisions. Uh, sociologists are happy to talk about history, so why don't historians uh, talk about sociology? I, I, I don't get it. <laughs> yeah. But why do you think it's that like that? I mean, is it because sometimes I think one of the, one of the problems we have had in the kind of the historiography, what historians do, is that they tend to, focus and we do have a partly different historical tradition here is basically they they tend to focus on small periods of times i mean i mean what's going on in uh, in a certain province between 1822 and 1882 to take a long stretch but normally just like five years or six years and then draw conclusions from that and i mean i think that historians are in our traditions are too weak on trying to do more longer period studies or trying to understand their their ideas in a more sociological understanding and i think that's uh, perhaps sometimes difficult when you do when you do more qualitative studies than you do it very locally uh, because long long terms tends to be quantitative and all this kind of stuff and then you lose a lot of discussions i think there's something ingrained in the way we write history that tends to make it difficult for us to do these conclusions. I mean, I, I like the, I mean, I love the long trends. I like to speculate about the long changes. And I think that's very central when we're trying to understand the, the impact on what's going on today with childhood and, and what's, and how that is, kind of ties it all together. And also the ability to tie, to be able to tie social change to, to political change. Because that's also a challenge in itself, and and, uh, and I think historians tends to do either or, and I, I do think I see that also in in a lot of the American historiography that you don't you do either you don't tie them together the way you could have done, 
uh, which then I, I would agree and just as a brief response i'd say historians have been in the business of putting themselves out of business for several decades and they're really pretty uh, good at that. They, <laughs> making themselves hyper intellectual um oh i can't be a presentist so i can't talk about how my research possibly re relates to something current and i think it's a sad state of affairs for the entire profession so i am excited that something like the history of childhood or the history of children uh however you want to look at it but that that has the ability to be interdisciplinary as well as apply what we learn from the past to present issues uh mm -hmm. laura you're shaking your head maybe you've got another thing to add to that well, I, I think it's especially, you know, history is trying to revive itself around public history. And I just remember I could find people to write policy statements or policy claims in children's history because they really, I think, could make that connection. But I think once you move outside of that field, it's it's much harder and I can't figure out that that issue but i think it's because the people who tend to be interested in the history of children and youth are people who are thinking very concretely about the structures within which children have to negotiate and how we can learn from the past on that so we've been experiencing my yeah, we've been experiencing um, declines in um, history program enrollments for 15 years and um, I guess I'm wondering whether the interdisciplinarity of history of childhood or childhood studies um, is a, a way forward, whether it's about public history. Um, is, there, is there a chance that the history of childhood is going to go the way of family history in that, you know, um, things have a, you know, a trajectory that they go up and there's a lot of interest and then, and then they wallow if, if we um, don't take care. Is there, do you have any sense of a history of childhood moving away from history or of being thoroughly embedded in history and then it's going to be dragged down with um, the, uh, what, what's happening to history programs? Or uh, I know um, some of you have worked in, or you teach interdisciplinary um, already, but um, any thoughts on Here's, here's a thought. Uh, the humanities are in deep trouble, at least in the United States. The number of majors is declining radically, and the arguments that humanists have made in defense of the area have been fallen on deaf ears. People are not much taken with the idea that we own critical thinking or uh, Increasingly, our broad area is viewed as a vestige of the past and of a Eurocentric culture that has had its time, but that time is now past. But children strike me as perfect uh, targets for humanistic analysis. Here we're talking about beings with their own distinctive psychology, with their own distinctive sensibilities, with their own distinctive cultures, all of which develop over time. We're talking about experiences that change. For example, we've lived through, literally lived through, the discovery of a whole host of disabilities of childhood that were not recognized in the past. Uh, if not in our own lifetime, certainly within our parents' lifetime. Dyslexia, autism, attention deficit disorders, all kinds of food allergies. These were not recognized or labeled as they are now. We, in other words, deal with uh, the application of the most advanced humanistic modes of analysis of understanding how categories are constructed, how even disabilities are constructed. They're not simply uh, innate. Uh, and, and so I have a feeling that if we play our cards right, and we do talk about the relevance of our field, 
the history of childhood is as good a vehicle as any for getting at those larger questions. So can I just offer, you know, every single issue of the journal, we had a submission for somebody who worked on childhood in Africa. And, and I always felt that that was just one of those dynamic fields. And we published a lot of people yeah. um, in, who then went on to become big scholars in the field. And so I do think we do have that reach. Um, mm. Well, I could comment it on a slightly different way. I think that, I mean, what I see at my old department is that a lot of the very, very good historians of children and childhood are very good scholars, which they, which means that they are then also within the multidisciplinary department recruited or engaged to or enthused to do other kind of work, sociological work, and, and uh, where there's more money. So suddenly, or, or money, or, or, or it's very, I mean, given the fact that they are interested in changing and influencing things. So if you write about adoption or abortion or or suddenly you are involved in medical or sociological projects about about uh, well all the different kinds of medical treatments and and uh, dealing with children with handicap or with well functional variations and stuff like that so suddenly they are kind of sucked into other disciplines and doing other kind of work and they really don't do any more historical work in the true sense of things which is a factor that they are trying to show that what they're doing and what they know is relevant to society. So there is a kind of a trend to that. But then there's another aspect, I think, in terms of the history of, of children and childhood. And there's one thing very uh, central change in the understanding of childhood in, in modern Europe or in the Scandinavian countries anyway, is that looking at children as being not little adults, but very much like adults. I mean, basically, and I sometimes argue when I've writing, been writing about uh, the ban on the physical abuse of children, is by banning physical abuse of children. You change the notion of rights that children have. You no longer say that children have rights as children, special rights as children, but you basically say that children have the same right as adults, that is respect for the physical integrity. You cannot beat them because you cannot beat an adult. And that has kind of really propelled the whole discussion about children into a notion of understanding children as having the same rights as adults. So there's a kind of transformation of the notion of children as being something very much similar to being adults. And I think that in one way, in some ways, dissolves the engagement in looking at well i think one thing good thing with this is actually it allows you suddenly to not look at the division between social policy towards adults and children as being two different things because it's basically the same thing but it's also something that uh, plays down the special history the special character of the past history of children or young people so it's kind of a double thing there, and I don't know where, where we're going with this and, and what effect that will have, but it's a very important aspect of, of uh, the understanding of children and childhood in, in currently, because it, it un underlies all their kind of rights discourses around children and their right to participate and, and, and in society and so on. It, in some ways, uh, Steve, maybe you can talk about this through your book, uh, Huck's Raft, because Huck's Raft really showed how the very definition of childhood changed over time. And that may, maybe there isn't a division between children and adults in the same way, you know, that we, as far as a future goes, maybe that's going to change. Well, I, I think there is no doubt that a certain conception of childhood, a romantic conception of children as pure and innocent and needing to be sheltered from the uh, corruptions of the adult world, that has broken down. Kids simply don't want to be kids. And I, from the time they can talk, they talk back. 
uh, and they don't <laughs> want to be deferential in the way That's something happening in America at least idolize <laughs> children in the past. Uh, and I do think the uh, special knowledge or expertise that adults supposedly held has been proven incorrect. Uh, not only are young people superior usually to adults in terms of their technology acumen, but they're much more in tune with shifting ideas about sexuality or gender identity and a whole host of other profound changes that are taking place in the culture. And increasingly, we're seeing older adults as laggards in this process of social change and out of it in a really fundamental way uh, where we're increasingly seeing young people as the pace setters in the development of a new society. And we can speak to that. Uh, we can see that a certain romantic conception of childhood was a construct of a particular era mm -hmm. and was created in a variety of ways that we can describe. It never was an accurate depiction of children, but it was a norm of some sort. And, and it shouldn't surprise us that it's changing once again. And it seems to me that this is one of the ways that we can speak to a broader audience, whether it's a popular audience of parents or it's an audience of policymakers who are trying to figure out the best approach forward. Clearly, the school systems that were designed beginning in the 19th century no longer seem to do an adequate job with many of the kids we have. Uh, just as our colleges don't look quite as uh, adapted to the needs of students as we once felt they were. Uh, what do we have to contribute to that discussion? I think it's, I, I, as somebody who's come to a place that was the first um, children's literature program in the country, um, it's been really exciting to realize what departments are interested in what we have to talk about. I have a colleague who's a pediatrician who said all of the residents in her, in her section really want to hear and to work on the history of children. Um, the, as, as you mentioned, the discussion around sort of trans rights and, and identities and really sort of there's, there's a place where historians are speaking to, um, you know, the fact that we're, we're being invited to present at the history of the Society of Education. Um, we write the sh shifting interest in the history of children and youth away from pedagogy um, to kind of a, a, a field, different fields that I think are very excited by what we have to offer. Public history, the discussion around what it means to go to a dark memorial, right, to go visit a a site that commemorates a, a dark part of our history and what that what how children respond to that you know i think there's a lot of sort of places where we are already speaking um and i think we're going to continue to grow in those areas mm. but there is an issue about how how much of a discipline the history of childhood can be and and uh, sometimes people deplore the fact that that the history of childhood is not kind of evolved into a proper disciplinary field like diplomatic history or whatever. And, and uh, I mean, you can, not, you can actually argue that, but I don't see that there is a specific norm for what, an hist what a field should be and look like. I do appreciate the fact that the field of, uh, of the history of childhood is but children and childhood is a kind of a multidisciplinary field which borrows and uses and interacts with different fields and also is diffusing into different areas. And, and, uh, and I think that is a very important aspect of the, what I would say, the success of the history of childhood. Because I do think that this has have had a very important impact on policy on regulation about children and the understanding of the role of children in society and stuff like that as something involving and, and, and uh, active. And uh, on the other hand, I mean, any field needs to be sustained by having a, a nucleus, a center, 
I mean, it has to develop a theoretical discussion. It has to keep on questioning things and criticizing itself. I mean, there has to be some sort of self-reflection. And there, I think, such an organization that Society for the History of Children and Youth plays a, a tremendous role, uh, that it does that, and that people get together, even if they perhaps, I mean, we, as a collective group, we have all kind of stayed within the field, but there's people that have been coming in and going out, and it's a field where there's a big transient population going in and out. And, uh, and I would say generally that, that they have a lot of lessons to learn because they are coming in and they just started doing it. I'm, I'm doing my second book on childhood uh, kind of stuff. And, and then, uh, and, and because I think that some of the stuff that you guys are doing is much more mature and more intellectually founded because you've been working in the field for a longer time. And I think it's important that there is a certain kind of group sustained that is able to do that, to infuse and help and develop uh, and interact with people that is kind of visiting the fields. But I don't see that necessarily as a weakness. I think that's uh, something that could be understood as a strength, as, a, as a, something positive, particularly in the fact of policy, I mean, being relevant and, and uh, speaking to, dip, to different aspects, because there are, I mean, there are aspects of other fields that are very insular. I mean, parts of the, I mean, you can mention many, many of the historical fields are very kind of isolated in their own intellectual spheres. And, and, uh, and that also goes to parts of, of child studies. I mean, I'm very, I worked in the child studies department for a very, very long time. And I do think that to a great extent, child studies is not a model for what the history of childhood should do because that history of childhood has a much more much broader uh, relationship to different parts of society different parts of the historical past while child studies uh, tends and sometimes to develop into a very literate very close very kind of methodological acute uh, discussions about very small thing very close to the children and stuff like that and that's good i mean that's that could be useful and that is something but it's something else and what historians could do i and think historians people... within that field need to challenge the the childhood studies way of doing close-ups on children you know, my sense is that our field faces at least two tasks. I can only think of two tasks at the moment, but there's no doubt others. The first one is it needs to become more international and comparative. And there's already efforts underway in that direction, but we really need to build that. It cannot be largely a uh, Western field. It needs to truly be international and have more than a scattering of scholars around it who work on other eras and other uh, cultures, they can't be marginalized. They need to be at the center of the field. And the second is we need to speak as uh, vocally and articulately as we can to social scientists, to physicians, and to psychologists, because we have a lot to say, I think, and that that's a dialogue that can be super productive. I, I would add scientists as well um, yeah. to that um, because for a long time, of course, childhood was thought of as a biological state. Uh, <laughs> and now we've also said, of course, it's society that also helps to define what is and constructed childhood. Uh, but the scientists also have a lot to offer here. So having the ability to look at the history and change over time with the influence of and perspectives of interdisciplinary fields, that's something that is somewhat, I won't say unique, but uh, special about the history of childhood. So I hope that we can be leaders in taking the humanities into some of these areas um, that provide new pathways of looking at the human experience from a very broad perspective. And again, it just comes back to me that everything touches children, everything. So if there's one way to launch that, looking at how we all began, <laughs> how human beings begin and develop over time, 
um, starting with children seems like a key point. Okay. I'm just aware of the time and I'm wondering if it's, it might be time to wrap up this very interesting conversation. Um, and I think that um, the last few comments have given us a lot to think about in terms of um, maintaining a uh, history of childhood's um, vitality. Um, but also to think through about in this particular moment in time, we're, we're in a pandemic. Um, it means that our next conference is um, not in peril because I think we're going to adjust and we may be meeting virtually. And this may be a great democratizer in a way. It may mean that more people from um, around the globe are going to participate. Um, but it does make me, it reminds me, this really interesting conversation reminds me that how important it is to keep in touch, to be um, not just communicating in with published words, but, but rather it's what happens when you bring people together, the kinds of ideas um, that get mixed around and that can be very generative. So I want to thank you all for um, what you contributed to um, the History of Childhood and Youth um, and the Society for the History of Ch Childhood and Youth. Um, and uh, also just, um, I very much look forward to seeing you hopefully at the next uh, conference. Yes. So, Thank you very much for leading the discussion. It was great. Great. And, and also you. on that note, it was wonderful to see you guys in real yeah. life. <laughs> <laughs>